Hello everybody, my name is Taylor McCurdy and welcome to today's AFRICAM show, of course powered by explore.org. If this is your first time joining us, remember that this is a live and interactive show. So I would love to, of course, hear from you. So send through as many questions as you like, but keep them easy because if you know me, you know I struggle with the difficult ones. Anyways, uh, thank you, Rolling Trouble, for uh, saying you're know, happy for my first solo show. Well, I think I have done one of these a little while ago, though, so, it's, um, so I think it's my second one. The pressure is on today. Ozzy uh, Jan, you say good afternoon. Coffee time for you. That's good. I'm trying to keep hydrated today with water because it's quite warm. And uh, yeah, pretty, pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to the cooler temperatures though as we go into winter here in the low felt of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, Dia, you said from your good morning from Seattle. Hello. And uh, you're also ready with your coffee. I didn't have coffee this morning. I had, no, did I have coffee? I can't even remember. No, I did have coffee yesterday. I had tea. I sound like, you know, change it up. But anyways, we are here at Tao, of course, uh, in Madikwe, uh, enjoying the wonderful afternoon sun. And you can see all of the water buck, males and females, submerged in water as they prefer to be. Oh, Gemma, just jumping on, you've said uh, good day from a sunny New Jersey. That's wonderful to hear. It's always good when the weather is nice. So if you have never, ever seen water buck before, uh, and you come on a safari in South Africa, for the most part, it's quite confusing when people call them water buck and they're just standing in the bush veld, because that's typically how you see them. But whenever there's that opportunity to submerge themselves in water like this and feed on various aquatic vegetation, they absolutely will. And I think they're much happier. When you've got long, shaggy coats like that, it must get quite hot. Um, and it's a nice way to, of course, cool down. And it looks like there's some um, white stalks Oh, the yellow gold stalks, I can't see from here. I keep wanting to pick up my binoculars, you won't believe it. Or actually, I'm also guilty of uh, tapping the screen and trying to zoom in. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that's obviously not going to work. So it's sometimes a little bit on the tricky side to identify the birds at this distance. No, that's a yellow gold stalk for sure. And uh, that big one just on the right, uh, near the male water, uh, a water buck. But how? Epic is this. This is so lovely. I wouldn't mind actually setting up a little hide here myself. I think it would be great photographs uh, that could come from a dam like this. And of course, we've got the live camera here so we can just sort of sit and, uh, and sit and watch to see what is happening. And I'm sure there's lots of other bird life that we just don't really get to see. So binoculars are also, of course, very handy. Jurel, good morning from Toronto. Awesome. You're also having coffee. What kind of coffee, you know, does everybody drink? Because I will quite spoiled. Every time I go on a safari throughout Africa, uh, I always bring back uh, coffee from various places, which is my favorite thing. So I've got Kenyan coffee at the moment. I'm currently drinking Zambian coffee, which is delicious. I've got some from Tanzania and I've got from somewhere else as well, but I forget. Oh, Bob from Kalamazoo. Hello. It's good to hear from you again. Um, what are you drinking today, Bob? Everyone's on coffee, I'm on water, and the water buck are indirectly consuming water too, I suppose. Of course, there's an Egyptian goose just perched out in the sun on the rocks. It's quite an interesting water hole. Oh, you're going to go for a swim. Okay, off you go, back into the water. So I'm, of course, used to watching yellow-billed storks, that bird on the left-hand side as they uh, move around during much clearer water. This is quite nice to see some water with some lilies and some other vegetation on top. Oh, sorry, there you go. Mom and calf just uh, stealing the show and of course a water buck bull just prancing on through. It's nice. I wonder why he's after her. He looks like he might be a bit too eager. Mister, she's definitely not going to be an Easter. She's got a very young calf at her side. But there are lots of exciting things for us uh, to talk about this afternoon, and we can, of course, always come back to the towel cam. Fingers crossed that a herd of elephants make their way. But I think what we'll do now is let's go all the way across to Kimberley to Campus or Kampers Dam to check out the flamingos. 
my Afrikaans accent is very terrible, so unfortunately I will say Camphers Dam, but um, a lot of South Africans will be rolling their eyes at me. Anyways, this is a wonderful scene, and this is actually quite a special, uh, special place in Kimberley. Not many people go to visit Kimberley in South Africa. However, I, I've never been there. I would go to Kimberley to visit this dam, though. So Camphers Dam is about 400 hectares. It's enormous, and it is also the only breeding site maybe you've already heard this, for lesser flamingos. How crazy is that? Because they don't breed anywhere else in, uh, in South Africa. Oh, hang on. We're going to come back to flamingos. Something exciting at Miledi. Let's see if we can still catch it. Look at that. It's a mongoose. I was a bit slow there. Okay, it's a little mongoose just moving through the grass. So Miledi is in Baluli. Game reserve. Oh, there they are. Now I can tell you exactly what species it was. I was going to have to try and guess it. But um, those are, in fact, dwarf mongoose, my favorite mongoose species, and an Egyptian goose, and also a fork-tailed drongo. Everybody is here at the band today. And this is such a strange little waterhole. It's, um, it must be quite interesting when the cats come to drink at it. I'm sure they'll have to stand up with their two feet and, and lean on in, but there's no cats. And how do the mongoose drink? I see it looks like it's seeping down. Oh, never mind. The mongoose can, of course, drink because there's an entire dam there. Ah, Amber, you've just said you've just remembered it's Tuesday and we're able to look at all of the cameras. Yes, I know. How exciting. I'm, I'm quite excited by this. I'm not shocked that there is also a dwarf... Um, I mean, a, not a dwarf drongo, a fogtail drongo with the, the dwarf uh, mongoose. But the mongoose seem to have scuttled off. They weren't really spending too much time. He has you know, great associations a lot of bird species have with the smaller mammals. And it would have been nice if we could have witnessed it. Maybe that drongo swooping down, catching uh, or feeding amongst the, the mongoose, catching any little insects that it might have missed. He's just having a little scan around the water. Nothing laying in the shade, not laying, lying in the shade. Hmm, a good place for a sneaky leopard, don't you think? To sort of just be sitting there waiting, or even a lion. But not today. This is where we had a lioness, I think, if I'm not mistaken. She, uh, a little while ago, and Trish and I were hosting Wild Moments, and she came down to drink, so I don't know if she's still in the area, but something to definitely keep an eye out for. But, of course, there are many eyes on the different cameras. Wait, Forktail Dronco spotted something, and perhaps it has caught something. But we'll never know. Let's go back and have a look at the flamingos until something exciting develops. Oh, Bob, you're drinking a Diet Coke. That's wonderful. Do you prefer ice with your drink, or do you just have it room temperature? Or I suppose you can also just have it from the fridge. Anyways, flamingos, however, do not enjoy Coca-Cola, and not at all. And um, you can see that, of course, there are lesser flamingos, the smaller ones, and then the larger ones are also greater flamingos. So it's nice to see the two, and I think that those are uh, red-knobbed coots in between all of these birds. Looks like them. There's lots of them standing on the various bits of vegetation. Some of them are swimming. But like I was saying, so lesser flamingos don't really breed in very many places throughout Africa. In fact, there are only four breeding sites. So this is quite spectacular that this is the only site in South Africa. And uh, I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen breeding, nest building um, behavior from flamingos before. It'd be quite, uh, quite interesting to, to go and witness uh, something along those lines. Has anyone seen it before? Has anyone actually maybe gone to follow, you know, the flamingos? This is, is breeding season at the moment. And it's actually quite a nice time of the year to, to also visit any, like, you know, the big salt pans or the, the sodic pans that you find across Africa because normally you'll get a, a gathering of, uh, of flamingos. Um, and I remember when I was down in the Eastern Cape, I always talk about the Eastern Cape, there were some, some little freshwater pans along the tidal rivers. So they were, yeah, water was brine, it was salt water. And we used to see lots of flamingos. No breeding going on though, they just used to make, uh, make use of those pans. Also an unusual area for them and, and very much seasonal. 
and depending on how much rain we had would also depend on whether the flamingos would sort of come back and that would definitely be the case here. But uh, I don't know how much water is within Camphers Dam. Like I said, it's over 400 hectares. What's that, over a thousand acres, something like that? Maybe just shy of a thousand acres. And um, yeah, it's, it's enormous. So this is just one section. I did read though that they tend to gather around the southwestern corner of Camphers Dam. It will be quite interesting to actually go there and to see how vast it is. But we don't even have any of the flamingos feeding, so I'm not going to talk about how they feed. At the moment, they're just enjoying the sun and balancing on one leg and preening their feathers, just as birds like to do. Ah, Kim, you've asked if I have a favorite bird. I, I do. I mean, oh, God goodness, I love all creatures, big and small. My favorite bird used to be the secretary bird. Sorry, that's me squeaking some tacky under the table because um, I'm a fidgeter. Uh, so yes, uh, secretary bird was my absolute favorite and I used to see them all the time in the Eastern Cape. And then I kind of moved away from the Eastern Cape and traveled the rest of Africa, which was wonderful, but I stopped seeing secretary birds. And then I fell in love with white crested helmet shrikes. They are very entertaining to watch. They are birds that uh, um, live in groups together, so they're cooperative breeders, so it's not you know, just one that you can see, sometimes up to 10 in one flock. And they're very interactive when they feed, so they'll fl all flock into a tree and all fly between the different branches hoping to find caterpillars, grasshoppers, like pretty much anything. And so it's really, really entertaining. And they, make, they have the most beautiful sounds, too. I like the little clicking noises they sort of do at uh, close communication quarters. Kim, do you have a favorite bird? Does anyone have a favorite bird? Is your favorite bird on the screen right now? Is it a red knob coot or a lesser or greater flamingo? Perhaps. Anyways. Ah, Suki V, you said you're skidding in late. Perfect timing, in fact, better late than never. So hello to you. Shall we go and have a look at the heron? There is a heron apparently. I forgot which camera it's at, but we're gonna go and have a look and see what the heron is up to. Maybe the birds will start being a bit more active. Oh, this is now interesting. Okay. We have got, on the right-hand side, a yellow-billed stork. We've got a heron. And then, of course, we've got a couple of African spoonbills, which is wonderful. This is a perfect sighting. And the behavior that we're seeing the heron performing right now is quite interesting. So it's obviously got its wings sort of fold it out to its size, just absorbing as much of the sun's rays. And then every now and then when it does stop preening, you'll actually be able to see, if you look just below its beak and onto its long slender neck, you might be able to see it do the gula flutter. Oh look, the yellow-billed stork is joining in as well. So yes, they are sunbathing. This is um, not just to, of course, keep warm. But this is also a good way to try and get rid of parasites because parasites don't necessarily like the, the, the direct sunlight. And, it's, and it is toasty, let me tell you that. So they'll all move around uh, quite a bit. Um, but you might be able to see them do the gulaf flutter. So they're keeping cool. So that's cooling down via evaporation. They don't sweat like we do. Um, can you imagine? They just have soggy feathers all the time. If I was a bird, I'd be very soggy and I'd have to live in the water. Otherwise, I'd have some problems. And the African spoonbills doing the complete opposite. They're having a nap on one leg. And this is also actually a good way to regulate body temperature. I know quite often you'll see birds on cooler days. They'll bring one of their, their bare legs um, up, not on all bird species, of course, and will tuck them inside their bodies. And their feathers will sort of keep those legs, those bare legs, nice and warm. It's amazing that they're able to stand like that. I don't know if I could stand on one leg for very long. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Kim, you love the storks and the spoonbills. Me too. Uh, Rolling Trouble, you said that you like bald eagles. Hmm. Hello, Waterbucks has also joined the party now. Caroline, you've said also a spoonbill. Well, there we go. That's quite nice that some of the, the birds that are your favorites are on, on screen at the moment. Look at this young, curious Waterbuck. Are you going to chase the birds? Are you going to interact with them at all? He's licking its lips, thinking, hmm, maybe some fried chicken. No, I'm just joking, of course, that's, uh, that will most certainly not happen. Um, wishful thinking. 
but quite often you see young animals chasing birds. You see that all the time, especially little rhinos chasing cattle egrets. It's normally quite hilarious. Oh, hang on. Now there might be some fun because we've got a second autobuck calf. They are very curious about the birds. They're like, what are you? Oh, you move when I walk towards you. Okay. But they're not going to necessarily want to do anything with them. You might be quite excited and think maybe it's a new friend to play with. So developing relationships amongst other animals is important too. I don't think the birds want to have anything to do with them. I'm just chewing them. Or at least the, the spoonbills are up and flying around now. Perhaps they're going to start feeding, seeing as though they've been encouraged into the water. <laughs> but the birds can see that they're not a threat and they just slowly wade it off. Here we go, youngsters. You successfully chased birds away. Well done. That will stroke your ego. Oh, maybe they just wanted to eat nibble on the grasses that the birds are standing on. That could also be it. There must be so many frogs here and lots of little fish species. Hmm. Tim, you said, what does a spoon will do if it gets food stuck in its mouth? Well... Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think a lot of birds can have that problem where they might bite off something a bit bigger than they can chew. Not that they can, not that these birds that we're looking at right now, you know, pull parts of their prey, they're going to swallow everything whole. So for those of you who have just joined for the first time, spoonbills aren't actually filter feeders as they are commonly mistaken for. Um, they will use that that bill that's shaped like a spoon and snap it shut. So there are little sensory nerves that run on the inside of the bill. Same thing that happens with uh, the storks and the herons. And so they can't necessarily always see what's in the murky waters, um, but they will be able to feel movement. And they all have different feeding techniques, of course. So it depends on the day and perhaps what prey they're specifically looking for. So the chances of something getting stuck in its beak is possible. Maybe like a leg of a frog sticking out the side. It kind of just will tilt its head back and sort of shake it around quite a bit to try and get rid of it. Otherwise, it would have to potentially regurgitate its prey and then try and eat it again. Um, but for the most part, they get it right. And quite often, they, you know, birds will uh, take their prey and bash it and sort of make it a bit more pliable so it's easy to go down. And of course, if it's a fish, it's always head first. Right. It seems though the lady is starting to pick up and the, the impala have arrived for a drink. Oh, it's just one impala having an ear scratch. This is a beautiful big ram, and here we go, just cleaning itself off. Fair enough, if you're going to be at the waterhole at uh, 20 past 4 on a Tuesday afternoon, best you bet some ladies will be making their way down. Well, potentially not, but um, it is nice and hot this afternoon throughout the northern parts of South Africa, uh, so I suspect that some of the herds might be making their way down to drink, or perhaps he just was. But also the impala rams are starting to form territories, and this is going to be a hot spot. Um, but our impala has now disappeared, and we're going to go across to Tembe and have a look at some more. Oh, look, we've got two grazing species. We've got some female impalas and probably their offspring, and then the Egyptian geese. Can we call them a herd of Egyptian geese? Is that allowed? Are we allowed to just, you know, of course it's a flock of Egyptian geese, but that's, mm, or a gander of geese, but that's so kind of so boring. And I feel like when they're out here grazing like this amongst the impala, we should be allowed to call them a herd of uh, Egyptian geese, but that's just my unpopular opinion. So... No rams here, but like I said, it's this time of the year, coming into April, the, uh, we, we've been hearing the uh, impala rams rutting, making that gurgling sounds right through the night, letting everybody else know um, that, uh, that they're there and the spot is occupied. Nice little termite mound there too. Just munching away. It looks like there's some nice grazing. The grass is quite short in some areas, so it must be a popular place for animals to feed. I'm trying to remember if this 
camera is close to the waterhole. I think it is, which would explain why the grass is so short and cropped already, because we know that all the animals, um, of course, do most of the feeding uh, near waterholes. Wonderful. Okay. Something exciting. The black eagle is on its nest. Now we can definitely have to go and have a look at that. This is insane. This is so special to see. I have been fortunate enough to see black eagles on nests before. I'm, no, it's just building. I got excited. I thought I saw a head coming out of the nest. I thought it's up. It's feeding. It's chick. It's not. It's just doing a bit of renovations. Just trying to make that nest structurally sound. And very typical to, to build them on cliff faces uh, like this. They'll use some branches extending from the side as an additional support. But they'll quite often just use the same nests over and over again. It's difficult to see inside this nest. You, you know, if you wanted to put a camera on top, I'm sure you could, but you would disturb it so much. So it's best that we just look from a distance. But if you were able to peer inside that nest, you'd be able to see all the nice leaves that they line their nests with. Oh, okay. So this pair is called Makatsa, is the female, and Malori is the male, and they were seen mating this weekend. Well, isn't that exciting? Hopefully, they'll lay some eggs. So there's definitely no chicks if, uh, not definitely, but there's likely no chicks in there if, um, if they've only been mating recently. This is awesome. They are one of the most elusive eagles because they are so specific about their habitat. So we don't get to see them very often and most people that go on safari will never see black eagles in their life, but they are extraordinary. And some of my best sightings that I have ever had are in the southern parts of Botswana in an area called Mashatu. And actually not very far away from where Medikwe is, in fact. And one day I was standing up on this huge rocky outcrop. And we were having tea and coffee. We'd hiked up. It took us four or five hours to hike to the top of this uh, outcrop. And while we were sipping our coffee and dipping our rusks and, you know, eating them, the next minute we heard this sort of sound coming off from our right. And around the bend... And right in front of us, there was a, a pair of black eagles, and it was so spectacular to see them hunting. And that's exactly what they were doing, is that they were scouring these rocky outcrops uh, for hyraxes, specifically dassies they love, and pretty much anything else they can find. But their technique that they use is just amazing. So to be eye level with these birds, and they're huge. They really, really are, you know, enormous. Um, sort of one higher than the other, and... So the one flushing them out and then the one that's flying slightly higher will actually do the drop down and, uh, and grab their prey. But exciting times to come with the, with the black eagles and hopefully they are successful and at least when they lay their eggs, um, hopefully one of them will survive. They normally lay about two eggs or so, but that, that will sort of depend. Oh, that was, a, that was a terrible takeoff. Did you see that? Oh, and then bounce off the branch and go. Very interesting. Uh, Rolling Trouble, you said you're so happy to see the black eagles. Me too. This is awesome. This is, um, I'm going to be quite excited to sort of follow their story and, and see how the rest of the year goes. Because a lot of birds of prey are late bloomers. When I, and late bloomers, yes, they take a long time to develop, but also in terms of the breeding season. They don't always breed during the summer months like most other bird species. But there are a number of them that only start breeding now sort of April, May, June, and even into July. Ah, really Trouble, we've also said that the black eagles have uh, just been bringing sticks building this nest. It's Obviously, I, um, I don't know too much about this particular pair, but I'm going to do some investigating for sure. So if you have got any interesting information for me about, uh, about Malori, and how do I say the other one's name again? Makatsa. Please, um, please do send it through. So I'd be quite curious if it is the same nest. Is it a new one? Those sticks don't look particularly... Um, you know, sort of new. They will obviously go for sort of older sticks, but you know, what's, there's a lot. There's a lot of branches there, so perhaps they're just you know, re-establishing it from the from a previous uh, breeding season. Oh, you watched a chick last year. Woo! -hoo! That's amazing. Okay, well, fingers crossed that uh, that we'll be able to to continue to watch this. It's a good place. There, eh? not too many predators from. Uh, 
at this sort of height. Snakes maybe, if you're lucky, but good luck for the snakes. Those uh, black eagles are quite something. Ah, Kirsten has said that you watch them from small white fluff to fully fledged. Ah, so it looks like the nest is going to fall out, and is, or is it just the view that we have? Um, it's a bit tricky to, it's, it's quite difficult to say. So I can understand what you're, what you're saying, by, that the nest sort of looks like it's falling down. It really is risky where these, um, where these birds will build their nest. There isn't a lot of stability around it. And so it's going to be relying on part of the cliff face, and then it looks like there's a tree. I don't know what tree it is. I almost want to say it looks like a shepherd tree or of some kind, just looking at the smooth gray bark, but I could be horribly mistaken, um, to, to sort of help support that. And if they're using the same nests every single year, they're adding more and more weight onto it. And at some point, the nests do collapse, and then they have to either a start again. For the most part, I've seen, especially with African fish eagles, when their nest does collapse, because they'll use their nest for years and years, when I was in the Eastern Cape, there was one pair that were using the nest, I think it was over seven, eight years, um, which was quite spectacular. They had a pretty good um, reinforcement, though. They were built it on a euphorbia tree, and there was a couple of other branches. Um, so that was quite nice. So it, it's, yeah, it's, it's very hard to say. And it's also quite dark. You can't really see, like, how, how deep do, uh, do the caves sort of go in on those rocks. So we have to just use our imagination, I suspect. So we go and have a look at the uh, waterbuck. Let's go and check out the waterbuck at Tau. Maybe the birds, the the e birds, the eagles come back. Uh -huh. Still having a drink. These waterbuck bulls are very curious with the with the females, and especially these females that have got young calves. Their hormones are all mixed up at the moment, though, so I think they're getting excited for nothing. I mean, that, that little calf over there, that's still very young. That can't be even six months yet. I don't go from here. I'm just guessing, of course. Maybe three months? Somewhere around there? It still looks quite little. What are you doing, mister? Oh, she's, she's resting her head on him, too. Perhaps they're going to do a little bit of grooming? Look at that. Or oh, she's just using him as a rubbing post, and he doesn't quite get the picture. I could see how that could be, oi, there could be uh, mistaken for flirtatious behavior, but let's see, he, oi, he did the old leg tap and a hop, skip and a jump. If she was really keen, she wouldn't move. And I suspect that this calf is hers. I mean, there could be other water buck around. We have, we have, uh, we have seen that. So, and he doesn't look particularly old, and then he moves off. So I think just taking a chance, getting a little bit excited about the wrong hormones, unfortunately. But um, he's got a long, a long way to go. And I'm sure if there were any um, adult bulls that, you know, that are mature, would be standing there watching, laughing at him. But he can only try his luck. It's, uh, it's quite a thing for antelope to mate, um, and it does take, I'm sure, a lot of practice before you sort of get it right but she's not really that interested. I think she was. She was just using him for a moment of affection and a bit of a scratching person. I mean, thank you, and now I'm going to carry on. Head back down and munching away, which I am quite excited for. I need to figure out what I'm going to have for dinner. A little water back, though, not too worried about feeding, which also suggests that it's still predominantly suckling. And when it comes out into the open like that, you can really see how small it still is. I wonder if there's a game drive vehicle close by, because look how they've both got their ears pricked up, and I thought I heard little voices in the background. So maybe, just maybe, that little one is now watching some people. Oh, she goes into the mud, no worries. I'm going to go and have a drink. Ah, sorry, yes, it's, it's the lodge. It's quite nice to sort of start your afternoon like that. And uh, before even leaving the lodge, seeing all sorts of wildlife. And this camera is just going to get busier and busier as dry season is now upon us. Tell me you said you love their noses. They have got rather large noses. Always wait. 
and everyone always describes them as heart-shaped noses. I love that she's walking through such shallow water as she still sticks her tail out and, and it's one of the, my favorite things. Do they do it because they don't like their tails getting wet or are they worried that a crocodile might leap out and try and jump and catch something that's uh, dangling in the water. But it has been a, a wonderful show this afternoon. I'm a bit sad that the elephants didn't come down and drink. But perhaps they were there earlier. But a big thank you to all of you for uh, watching this afternoon's uh, show and for sending through all your questions. I look forward to, of course, having the opportunity to host you all again. See you next time. Bye.